of year 2013, I welcome you all in this highly esteemed gathering. It's my privilege now to call upon Dr. Arvind Mayaram, Secretary, Department of Economic Affairs, to deliver the welcome speech. To begin with, I would like to express my gratitude to the Honorable President for taking out his valuable time and agreeing to meet the officer trainees of the 34th batch of the Indian Economic Service. Sri Pranam Mukherjee, the 13th President of India, crowns a political career of over five decades of exemplary and illustrious service to the nation, in the government as well as the parliament. I am glad that before the officer trainees proceed for institutional attachments across the country, they have got this opportunity for a formal interaction with the Honorable President. It is indeed a proud and special moment for these young officers and will surely inspire them and leave an indelible print in their minds as they embark upon their journey as civil servants. Having himself spearheaded the Ministry of Finance in the past, which is also the Carter Controlling Authority of the Indian Economic Service, the Honorable President is aware that the Indian Economic Service is an organized Group A Central Service. The IES was constituted in 1961 with the objective of institutionalizing core professional capacity within the government to undertake economic analysis and render advice for designing and formulating development policies, strengthening delivery systems, and monitoring. The IES celebrated its Golden Jubilee in the year 2011-12. The Golden Jubilee celebrations were inaugurated by Sri Mukherjee, the then finance minister in August 2011, which was marked by a series of events which included launch of website of the service, special lectures, two book releases, and other events. The contributors to the volumes, two volumes which were, uh, which, which were, uh, uh, which were uh, published were IES officers serving at senior levels in various ministries. The 34th batch of Indian Economic Service consists of 29 officer training, comprising 12 lady officer trainees and 17 gentlemen officer trainees. Given the fact that masters in economics is a minimum degree for appearing in the IES exam, the batch is highly diverse in terms of background, ranging from graduates from the Delhi School of Economics and Jawaharlal Nehru University to that of the Indian Institutes of Technology. The training of the officer trainees commences with the foundation course at uh, Hyderabad, followed by various specialized institutional attachments and a district attachment for about two months. The training also includes an overseas attachment with the Civil Service College, Singapore, with a view to give them an exposure to the international best practices. The total training period spans over a period of approximately 16 months. The specialized attachments have a rigorous course module, which is constantly updated in accordance with the changing requirements of the globalized world. With this brief background, I would once again thank the Honorable President for agreeing to meet the budding officers. I now request Ms. Nayantara and Mr. Deepak to briefly share their training experiences with the Honorable President. A very good evening to the Honorable President. Secretary of the Department of Economic Affairs, Sri Arvind Mayra, the Chief Economic Advisor, Sri Raghuram Rajan, esteemed dignitaries and other members of the Indian Economic Service present here. It's indeed a great privilege for all of us to be here and for me to speak on behalf of the 34th batch of Indian Economic Service. Sir, we are a batch of 29 officer trainees hailing from 16 states across the country. Apart from having officers who are fresh, fresh postgraduates, lecturers, and researchers from various universities of the country, our batch also comprises many officers who have previously served in organizations like ICICI, National Housing Bank, Central Statistical Organization, the Reserve Bank of India, and the Delhi Police. We are currently undergoing our induction level training at the Institute of Economic Growth, Delhi, after completing our foundation course from the MCR Institute of Human Resource Development, Hyderabad. And so far, our training program has focused on varied aspects like decision making, physical fitness, mental endurance, along with the academic and technical aspects related to our service. 
And I also take this opportunity to record our appreciation towards some of the new changes that have been introduced into our training program this year, such as field visits, specialization at country and subject level, and public program evaluation modules, which is quite in sync with the growing needs of the Indian economy. Sir, we believe that the last eight months of our training has laid a strong foundation for us to become a balanced person in life, and more importantly, a responsible public servant. Our biggest motivation in joining this service was to be a part of the policy-making machinery of the Indian government. And we are very much looking forward for our chance to make use of our expertise in economics to serve the nation. Thank you. A very good evening to the Honorable President, Secretary, Department of Economic Affairs, Sri Arvind Mayaram, Chief Economic Advisor, Sri Raghuram Rajan, respected dignitaries and members of Indian Economic Service present here. Having this opportunity to speak on behalf of 34th batch of Indian Economic Service, I would like to express the view that as Indian Economic Service probationers, we think that one of the key requirements of good governance is good decision making and good public policy. With growing complexities and challenges of current Indian economy and rapidly globalizing world, decision making in government should be guided by economic rationality and must be armed with analytical reasoning. Indian Economic Service provides us, as a public servant, immense opportunity to be part of government decision-making process and shape public policy with economic reasoning and rationality. Being an interministerial and interdepartmental service, it provides us with the scope to work and contribute in diverse range of fields like finance, planning, social sector, rural development, infrastructure, agriculture, information technology, etc. In the span of our service, we are looking forward to handle diverse responsibilities like rendering economic advice, administration, implementation of various development programs and policies, besides dealing with areas like regulation, monitoring, and evaluation. Roles and responsibilities of economic service have broadly expanded in the era of economic reforms and throws open immense possibilities of career progression and service. 21st century is a knowledge-based century. In the new scenario, specialists have crucial role to play within the government in steering the public policy in desired direction. Making India economically strong and globally powerful is crucial for ensuring sustainable welfare of the people. We hope to deliver our best in the service of this nation and carry forward the aspirations of the founding fathers of this nation towards their fulfillment. Thank you. Dr. Aravind Mayra, Secretary, Department of Economic Affairs. Dr. Raghuram J. Rajan, Chief Economic Advisors, Officials, and Official Trainees of Indian Economic Service of 2012 batch. I'm glad to be amidst you this afternoon. First of all, I would like to congratulate you on your success in a difficult competitive examination which have enabled you to join the Indian Economic Services. It speaks of your academic excellence. Many of you have basic fundamental knowledge in economics, public finances, and now you are called upon to join the services to serve the government of India in different branches of its administration and to provide the inputs to the policymakers in the process of the formulation of public policy. It is important for all of you to underline that the very basic objective to provide good governance is based on sound policies which have ingredients of equity, justice, 
and inclusiveness. If you look at the process of development, I think one should feel confident that we have come a long way. It's true that in the process of economic development in this country, there have been ups and downs. Our journeys have never been very smooth. But at the same time, one will have to always keep in mind the circumstances in which our policies were formulated. <clears throat> when India obtained freedom in the midnight of 1947, the financial pace of the country, as it is consequence to the colonial rule for more than 190 years, that the economy was stagnant. The initial years, the role of India was to provide raw materials to the industries of the colonial masters and to be the consumers of the finished products. Whatever little bit development took place in industrialization, in infrastructure, that was to serve the basic objective of colonial rule. Therefore, in the long history of our freedom struggle, you will find not only that we wanted to have political emancipation, but one of the objectives of the political emancipation was, in the language of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first architect and the most important architect, first prime minister, when he was asked to define in 1930, 31 precisely, when he presided over the Indian National Congress at Lahore, that how do you define the concept of total freedom, which you are talking of? And he replied, and I quote a few words, to me, freedom means freedom from political slavery, freedom from economic bondage, freedom from cultural stagnation. We obtained freedom from political slavery in the midnight of 14th, 15th August, 1947. I welcome you to the very house which witnessed this transformation. The Darbar Hall just above this room, which witnessed the departure of the last Governor General of British India and welcomed the same gentleman, Lord Mountbatten, as the first Governor General of Independent India and the Council of Ministers shown in by Governor General. The Constitution was yet to be framed and the power was transferred by an act passed by the British Parliament in 1947. I'm happy to welcome you when you are entering into your career in building new India transforming socio-economic conditions to the place which has witnessed the development in this country over a long period of time. It is said, eminent economist Dr. Guram Rajon is your chief economic advisor, and many others, including Dr. Mehra, 
who are in the economic administration of this country for many years, that how we have proceeded keeping in our objectives in view of independent action taken. The first 50 years of the last century witnessed the annual average GDP growth of 1%. If there is disappointment of 5% GDP growth in the year 2012-13 as projected, disappointment is not in terms of the number or figure. Disappointment is in the terms of that nothing less than 8 to 9 percent and perhaps 10 percent annual GDP growth satisfy us. And it is not beyond our reach. Even if you look at in the canvas of a little longer time frame from 2003 4 to 2000. 12, 13, you will notice in these 10 years, our annual average GDP growth rate has been 7.9%. Despite the fact that out of these 10 years, four years were such where international economy languished continuously. After the major economic crisis of 2008-9, which is considered as one of the gravest crises, as serious as 1930s worldwide depression, we overcame it. Previous three years of 2008-9, we had more than 9% GDP growth. 